Ricardo's flying by helicopter. He will be. He actually he requested the helicopter earlier, but that's fine. He requested the helicopter in 10 minutes, and he will be landed here in 9:30 exactly. Salvador? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be warm, I understand. Yes, 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 very warm. <laughs> oh, you have a perfect shirt on for it. This is my uh, Deep South shirt. I wore my, <laughs> these are the colors of El Salvador. Oh, really? Good Max has the uh, South. I've got my orange shoes. Okay. <laughs> my orange <laughs> shoes, yes. <laughs> and the orange glasses, too. Exactly. Good. All Good. I see is orange. <laughs> as you were describing, as a, a trade. Yeah. You, you heard Barry Silbert in New York? Yeah. He said, this sounds interesting. Yeah. You, you took a position. <clears throat> and uh, you, you, it was on your radar. And you, as a trader and as a businessman, you made some, you, you, you were successful, you've been successful now, you've been into Bitcoin for a while. But at some point, this turned into something different for yes. you in your, in your mind, yes. in, the, in the way that you think. So what, what t walk, talk a little bit about that. Yes, as I was mentioning, my, my, my opinion about uh, fiat, the fiat fraud that's going on in the world, had been very clear for a long time. Uh, my dad and I are original gold bugs, right? So we were always very conscious about how the monetary debasement was going on from a long time ago, first with the British, and then with the, the Nixon uh, refusal of the gold exchange in 71. And then in, in the 80s in Mexico, we were victims of hyperinflation and devaluation. And our company went broke. So we knew all about fiat fraud, right? So when I took this trade and it became very successful and it forced me to look into Bitcoin in more detail, when I finally understood what it meant, which is finite issue, self-custody, unseizable, I said, gee, this is much better than gold, man. <laughs> because as long as it has a market, right? At the end of the day, it's an asset. For me, Bitcoin is an asset that you can trade. It's an asset just like an Apple stock or like a gold bar or like a ton of copper or like a ton of wheat. It's an asset and it has a market. And there's people out there who will buy the asset from you. And that's great, you know. Let's talk about this uh, fiat fraud for a second. So we're heading to El Salvador right yeah. now. <laughs> and this is a trip uh, that we are very happy to put together. Stacy was kind of uh, very excited about Our putting the, <laughs> the, the pieces together. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, we've known actually, uh, Don Hugo, we've known for many years, um, uh, and we've traveled with him and talked to him about gold and about the fiat fraud. And, yeah. And, and, but with El Salvador, there's another element to this because of course, as a Central American country, they've had to endure decades of colonialization, let's call it what it is, yeah. from the United States. Absolutely. And the president- That's a huge military base right there. And the president, Bukele, 
is seeing, to me, and I want to hear what you think about this, but for me, it seems as though he sees Bitcoin as a way out of the fiat money fraud on the sovereign level. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think sovereignty, sovereignty uh, the, so being sovereign <laughs> has many different aspects. And financial, the financial aspect is one aspect. But there's also the commercial aspect, the import and export. And I certainly think it's a very good step that uh, President Bukele has taken. But, I mean, to stop being a colony, it takes more than just issuing your own currency or having a solid currency. It helps, but it takes more. Right. Um, look, listen, we're Mexicans. Yes. And we're neighbors to the U.S. Yes. And we've been uh, either partners or victims of the U.S. for a long time. So it's, it's, very, it's a very complicated thing because there's flows of trade, there's flows of people, there's flows of investment. And uh, it's not easy to just be sovereign and meaning cutting ties. It's not good for anybody to cut ties. Well, having been in El Salvador myself now for months, I noticed that the people are have a smile on their face because they have money that's theirs. Yeah. It cannot be confiscated. Yeah. And it has it's deflationary in the yeah. sense that yeah. it it will move. It's up your original in time. savings. Right? Original savings. Yeah, yeah. And that, of course, is being talked about to their friends all over Central America and all over Mexico. So the people have a chance to stage a very uh, so. peaceful yes, 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 yes. revolution. Yeah, because look at this. Look, we have there the beautiful mountains of Mexico, the volcanoes, and then we have the great city of Puebla over there. And then we have close to 20 million people in this valley right here, which is the Valley of Mexico. Is this good for them? Is Bitcoin good for them? Absolutely, yes. But it's not good for the people in power. And well, they're not they're not giving away their power lightly. <laughs> so I am optimistic yeah. because <clears throat> I mean making payments in a digital way is absolutely the future. Yeah. And for example, we in 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 Mexico have been uh, leaders by far in our bank in installing uh, these applications that work on your phone and that are connected to your bank account and you can make payments, receive payments, uh, do shopping, and all the big variety of things that you can do with digital money. We do it with digital money, fiat money. Right. Right. Because we're not allowed to touch the crypto in the bank. Right. Right. So we know exactly what it's about. And in the moment that we can change the digital fiat peso into digital Bitcoin, we could do that in 10 seconds. Right. I mean, the systems are there. The procedures are there. The security is there. We can handle digital fiat. Right. So we can handle digital assets. I, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about your social media profile. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've undergone a bit of a, uh, a, a metamorphosis, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess you could say you're more accessible. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're more. We should uh, do that. Spontaneous. Huh? I have not <laughs> we and haven't done the picture for the social media. Yeah, let's do go. it. Let's do the let's do the photo. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> do it like that. Venga. There we go. I made that. because your father wanted to help save Greece yeah. from the debt fiasco there, the fiat fraud. It was fraud all the way through, right? Because Goldman Sachs helped them lie to get into the Euro. Uh, all that debt was underpriced for them because of the Euro, because they were like in a union with Germany. 
and so people were lending to them with the assumption that they would be bailed out. Uh, the Greek citizens were forced to pay 100% on all those debts. So, however, that mission failed. Your father was very eager to save them. Yeah. Today, we're flying with you, his son, to the savior. <laughs> it's already saved by Bitcoin. Like, why do you think, do you think, has gold, has precious metals failed? Did they fail? Did gold fail? And why does Bitcoin work better? I wouldn't say that they failed, you know, but I would say that there's a better asset now. It's a better asset because it can be more secure, it can be more portable, and uh, it has all the other, it's, it's more divisible, uh, verifiable, it, it's just a better asset in many ways. But there's a space for gold. I, I mean, I wouldn't be trashing gold because of Bitcoin. And I wouldn't also be trashing Bitcoin because of gold, you know. It's none of the others. Both assets can exist very well. You know, the, the reason the way we have this fiat fraud today, and what all this happened in Greece, is because originally the fiat money notes were convertible into precious metals. And that was a pretty good deal, you know. You could get so much gold for this nominal amount of fiat. It was like a token and you exchanged it. It's not a bad idea, that's not a problem. The problem is the system gets abused by the goddamn bureaucrats and thieves and they print more tokens than there's gold, you know? Yeah, that's the problem. So, no, I, I think that um, the fiat system has allowed the big state to exist and that means two things it means the the war state the national security state and on the other hand it means the welfare state so i call it the welfare warfare state that's what fiat has allowed to happen if it wasn't for fiat fraud those states uh, the size of those states could just not exist because they would have to tax people in an un, 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 uh, untenable way. Now, how do they get all these assets to do welf welfare and warfare? Yeah. By printing fiat well, and they, issuing debt. And the pandemic showed that because America, we shut down completely. Yeah, and, and everybody, had, you know, everybody go home, for two nobody years. work, and the government's going to maintain you, which is wonderful, you know. We should just make the whole world work like that. But then something else, <laughs> ju something else just happened over the past month, which was that the U.S. decided to blow up the dollar. Like they they froze reserves of Russia. Well, that's just a a tiny little bit of what's coming because before that, it happened to the Canadians, protesters, yes. Yes. right? Yes. Yes. So basically, everything you have in fiat doesn't really belong to you. You're allowed to have it as long as the big government decides it's okay for you guys to have it. And if they change your mind, you're screwed. So that's where we are. But now, coming back to being a sovereign state, if they can screw up Russia with their reserves, don't you think you can screw up El Salvador? Ten seconds. It's not going to even be the State Department. It's going to be some undersecretary. Now, I noticed that in the United <laughs> States, for example, a lot of politicians are becoming Bitcoiners. So we have uh, Thank, yeah, a lot, yeah, some of them. Cynthia Lummis in yeah. the state of Wyoming, and I think Ted Cruz in Texas, and others. So it's almost a, a fifth column. It's almost as if uh, the Bitcoin army has recruits <laughs> working inside the yeah. regulators. So at some point, uh, those people are going to be impactful, and they're going to be, and elections will start to, to be determined more in terms of who's for Bitcoin, and we may see it as in, as soon as the midterm elections in the United States. Yeah. Is that a would that be a, a counter narrative to what you're suggesting or talking about in terms of the the, the iron hand of regulation, the, the the black hand of bureaucracy, if you will? Can we convert enough people inside to neuter them, to to neutralize this? What do you think? I see you have a big faith in democracy. <laughs> Well, I think I have a big faith in incentives. And I think Bitcoin is perfectly aligned incentives. And when everyone is perfectly aligned, uh, nobody wins and nobody loses, but everyone is simply getting on and with this perfect money that is Bitcoin. You know, Max, uh, 
when you have the military industrial establishment uh, receiving uh, 800 billion per year in defense money, defense, no, they don't make war, they just defend, right? Okay. When you have 800 billion a year pouring into that establishment, and when you have, I don't know how many, but billions and billions and billions in social security and Medicaid, food stamps, going for the welfare state, that creates a lot of clients. And those clients are not going to vote themselves out of the government largesse, you know. So that's why it's not that, that the people don't know, is that the majority of the people are having a good life by living at the expense of another minority. In the United States, that the, the, the problem of printing money, which you would normally associate with inflation, has been masked, it's been hidden yes. for many years. Yes. By the CPI, which the is a big fraud which there is false, also. Uh, and by essentially America being so dominant in the world, they get energy very cheaply. Yeah. They get their clothes and computers very cheaply because of the dollar hegemony. And they can debt. Uh, they, they can. can uh, debt. And uh, people buy that debt. Raise money through loans. Right. Indefinitely. So China pays for America's wars. Yeah. That's fact, amazing. Yeah. But now, this year, in the last six months. Inflation is becoming real, yeah, and it's it's now at multi-decade highs, and there's no reason to believe it's going to go down no, no, anytime no, no. soon. No, it's going to go through the roof. In the past, when you have food inflation, like yeah. the Arab Spring, yeah, or in other places, uh, it, it you have social yeah, cohesion people. risk, yes. as the Economist yeah. magazine likes to call it, risk, <laughs> the risk of. Yeah. social cohesion evaporating yeah so that would be where you have a uh, reconciliation between the money printers and the reality of what they're doing and the people it's called insurrection yeah maybe i'm tainted by what happened in the 80s you know this guy was born in 86 we were right in the middle of this huge crisis and i've said it many times when i started working it, it, the Electra shops for my dad. We had 54 stores, 2,000 employees, and we had $9 million in debt. The exchange rate was 20 to 1. In 88, when this guy was two years, we were now at 3,000 to 1. Right? And there was no revolution. Yeah. There was just a change of regime. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but People was... were much less uh, connected and important. There were, yeah, that's true. There were no <laughs> social media. There were, you couldn't complain. There was one TV news channel, yes, one, which yes. was not mine. It's not a competition. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. But I, I, I watched you. <laughs> the I, the I, newspapers I, were totally controlled. I bet I've observed you mm. over the years on Twitter. And what I've noticed is like Bitcoin and the proof of work that goes into it it seems that, from, in my mind, I see you as kind of liberated. Like, you are a billionaire pleb now. Like, there's an equality <laughs> that is achieved without redistribution. Yeah. And like, this has been the past of the history. Yeah. Is people, like, we have either have dictators or monarchs or presidents or like, everything goes wrong. The power and, in the slaves. Yes, but yeah. now it's proof of work. There's no cantillionaire class. Like, it's, you either have the big point or you don't. And you, everybody works for one sat or you know, a hundred thousand Bitcoin. Yeah. It's, you all have to put in the work, and there's nobody who has an unfair advantage. Yeah, I love Bitcoin because it puts everybody on an equal basis in terms of purchasing power, and it gives no unfair advantage. No, there's a phrase for the U.S. It's called the uh, what is it? The extraordinary privilege of printing the world's money. It's pretty extraordinary. De Gaulle, Charles De Gaulle was <laughs> talking about that. Yes. What was it? Charles De Gaulle. Charles De Gaulle, in inspired by Jax Riff, who was this Minister of Finance. Yes. And you know what that happened, got them? Uh, Nixon closed the gold window. Closed the window. Yes. They, they, they defaulted the on the debt. He defaulted on the debt. Right. That was a major default. <laughs> you know, Stacy brings up an interesting point there about, okay, so, yeah, she mentions that you are a billionaire. Yes, you are a billionaire. So with that, a lot of people are coming to you and saying, Ricardo, I need this. Ricardo, I need that. 
with the Bitcoin protocol, you have no influence on it. No. You can change it. Is that liberating to a certain degree for you to just be Uncle Ricky? <laughs> well, you know, the social media has been a lot of fun. And um, uh, since about a year and a half ago, I, I took over the management of that because I had, I had the, the account managed by corporate handmaidens, you know, and they sanitized everything. So I, I continue to post a lot of stuff the, from my conferences and, and speaking engagements and ideas. So that, that's what I was posting. But I was not replying, I was not engaging at all. And I got these horrible things on my timeline, you know, aggressions and, and questionings, and nobody would answer. So I was so disappointed to say, I'm, I'm gonna get out of social media. And then I figured it out. I mean, the problem is that we're not responding. You know? So then we took a very aggressive policy of response. And that's what, what changed. You know? I, have, I have things to say and I, why would I stay shut up? You know? And can you can you translate for the uh, audience who doesn't speak Spanish? What does pendejo mean? <laughs> <laughs> I see you type that a lot on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> one of the favorites, huh? Yeah, the favorite one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> asshole. Yeah, it's a, not asshole. It's more like dumb shit. Dumb Dumb shit. Shit. Uh, okay, fair enough. Okay. But, <laughs> but this is, but, but I, I want to follow up on this. Is this, are you finding this for you, you're bringing back some fun yeah. in your life? Because, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was it's, with Bitcoin, it's like, look, it's, let me ask, is Bitcoin on a vector that's on its own that nobody can change and it frees everybody up? In, in something? including yourself, to be more of who you are. Is that a fair I think so. I think it's a, it's a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. Now, we, we are all prisoners of our own device, like the song. Eh? But, um, yeah, it helps, uh, you know, to be able to see the truth is liberating. Even if the truth is not what you want, yeah? But it's liberating in the sense that, that you know what to expect. You know what to expect. And you know what? We've been going to Bitcoin conferences since 2011. And over time, I've realized that, you know, though I hold a U.S. passport, though I was born there, though I, I'm blonde, I'm a woman, like what defines me the most is Bitcoin. And yeah. when we meet Bitcoiners from wherever they are in the world, whatever passport they hold, there's a, we're all yeah. the same. Like I feel more common with that. Well, well, you know, America has has this, uh, uh, has a lot of problems today, but for years it was an inspiration for the rest of the world because it said, America is the home of the brave and the land of the free. That is a fantastic phrase. Unfortunately, it's not true anymore. But it doesn't mean it can't become true again. And I think we should work as citizens and as, as humans to make the world yes. the home of the brave and the land of the free, not just America, you know. We should have the whole world free and with bravery to face reality. And, and that's why I think that the truth makes you free. It, it does. Well, we're heading to El Salvador and you look at the president, President Bukele, having to respond to U.S setting up a committee to look at El Salvador and their currency, like, what That's does that amazing. have anything to do with That's you? That's amazing. This is reminiscent of the big stick of Teddy the Roosevelt. Yeah. And no, they're not speaking softly, they're just pulling out the stick. Right. And then you can see the propaganda of the mainstream media. They just continuously call him dictator. Oh, yeah, and yeah. then you say, what sort of dictator gives the freedom, economic liberty, individual sovereignty that's impossible bit. because once you have uh, individuals free with their own monetary assets it's very hard to become to make them into slaves eh? it's, it's, fiat fraud is what facilitates the 
current day slavery. You don't own your assets. They're in the banks. I'm a banker. If I, if I, if I put my money in your bank, who owns my money? It's, you have your money at the pleasure of the Mexican government, Minister of Finance and the Minister of, um, not the Minister, it's a, a financial intelligence unit, which decides that it's okay for you to have it, or if it's not okay, in which case you're screwed. And that's true all over the world, in yes. the fiat system. They the everywhere, the they, we will freeze your assets like that. And, and uh, above the... On uh, an accusation, right. without even having a trial, much less a sentence. And why is it possible? Because the fiat system permits it. it they could declare that you could, you were to be frozen out of your Bitcoin keys, but it wouldn't be any use because it wouldn't they wouldn't work, right? right. And you're also uh, vulnerable to the current thing because now it's, it's yeah. that, but tomorrow it could be anything, you know, the current thing. Exactly. Like the current thing, it's Russia, it's Ukraine. It's Are you frozen this. because of the current yeah, thing? The current thing. Yeah. Right? Are you with the current thing? The bar keeps like on getting lower. No, well, that's that's we haven't talked about this, but this this monster they're creating, the central bank digital currency, this is a real monster. Now that is ages worse than the fiat system, much worse than the fiat system, because it is a hundred percent identifiable with the individual. So the, the, the new power of, would have the ability to know exactly how much money Max has in his wallet and how much Stacy and Hugo and Ricardo, and then they can, with zero problem, say, well, this guy has too much money. Let's take away 3% a year yeah. to redistribute, you know? And of course, the guys who are going to receive it are going to clap like uh, seals, like trained <laughs> seals. You know, oh, 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 yeah, give us the three percent of all the billionaires. No, why not? And then uh, the next step, be, well, you know, we noticed, dear Stacy, that you're spending way too much on cigarettes, and we're definitely not going to allow you to buy cigarettes. And then, oh, by the way. And uh, we should give more charity, so let's take some of this to the And you can do whatever you want. It's just a debit and credit in the wallet that they control. So that is a real... Uh, the, the ugly face of the central bank digital currency. So it removes the incentive for entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs. If the overlords can Absolutely. tap your account based on an agenda which is not well defined and very vague, and so the economy is comes to a complete standstill, yeah, 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 yeah. and it, it's it's horrible for everybody, right? I, I, I speak a lot in my conferences and, and writings about what do we need to do to achieve common prosperity. I mean, that common prosperity meaning that it's everybody is better off. What do we need to do? It's not so complicated. Listen, we need an environment of freedom, which permits and encourages and applauds innovation. So, freedom, innovation. And then we need a lot of competition. People copy your innovation and make it better. Competition. And this is a virtuous circle, and that's what gets you to prosperity. It's not so hard, right? Why do we not have innovation? Ah, because we don't have liberty, freedom. Yes. Why? Because tyrants. They love to control people. So, when the florin was, came into circulation in like 1252, do you think it was any coincidence that within a hundred years, florins existed as this? No, no, it's not a coincidence. It has everything to do. But see, what happened with Florence and and um, and Venice and Genova and Amsterdam is there were small republics. Yes. So. People could escape from one place to another, yes. right? Yes. And we have yeah. tons of people who escaped from from Milan, which was the richest one. Yes. And they went to Florence, which is not so rich, but they were freer, right? And the Florin had everything to do, you know, sound money, with trade. Yes. Because that's an and specialization. Yes. And, and it's all it's all uh, linked, you know. The, what is the essence of civilization? So, society. Why are we social? 
because we're different. And you can do some things, like a very good production here, and I can do some other things, and he can do others in those. And this difference in abilities leads us to different specializations, and it leads us to interchange, which is trading, which is barter. Yes. And you cannot have interchange, trade, and barter if you're on a war. But this war is completely the opposite of trade. We saw this, with, uh, we always say that Bitcoin is bringing on Renaissance 2.0, and you see that with El Salvador, you see the best in the world being attracted to it, want to go there. You're yeah, well, the here we are, you know. Yes. I didn't think I'd be going back to El Salvador. <laughs> yes, yes, but here you are. Come yeah. Like, our friend who is Mexican, he says that you are single-handedly the one most responsible for bringing any Bitcoin to Mexico. So, here you are going to El Salvador because here's the first president, of, yeah. the first family of Bitcoin, yeah. and we're all like the same yeah. family. Yes, I think it's a very interesting. Thing. And... And it's a, it makes you feel good. You can, you can do, a, you know, some people have these ideas about billionaires being cold, heartless creatures with no uh, uh, incentive or no in, interest in anything except making money. I think it's a, it's a terrible um, simplification, you know. And I'm not going to speak for anybody else. But, but frankly, for me, money has always been a medium uh, to do things. It's not an end in itself. And um, I'm sure that I can do a lot of things to make Bitcoin more popular in Mexico, and I'm doing them. I'm doing them. And I'm not waiting or asking for permission. I'm just doing them. Well, to, to follow up on this, um, <laughs> uh, Florence, um, you know, the House of uh, Medici, they're bankers. Uh, they introduced the standard of uh, currency, the Florence, yes. which was uh, reliable. Yes. And and we had uh, Da Vinci, and we had the, the Renaissance, Michelangelo. Yeah. Michelangelo. Yeah, yeah. So, is this a model to say? I mean, my question is to follow up on what you're saying is that people's perception of wealthy people is that they are not, um, they're 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 cold or calculating or they're not necessarily. Uh, it, interested in social let's say uh, the social welfare of betterment of, of yeah. betterment but but if you look at the Renaissance that's completely false I mean we see that a banker created the Renaissance so with Bitcoin being absolutely hard money and sound money perfect money is that a good model then is that where you because I know you have a, a keen interest in art so is this a is this where also a direction that you can go toward yeah I love I love that and um it's funny that you mentioned, but I have the original first edition of Luca Pacioli, uh, Principia Matematica, which is the, the, the first work that documented accounting, debit and credit and double entry bookkeeping. It happens to be I'm an accountant also. I'm many things, but... Um, and, and that was written in Florence. And I also have own or custody a beautiful Botticelli painting that, that um, reminds us of that, of that time. I've always been an admirer of the, of the oranges of the Medici family, and there's a very interesting book on that, on that family that uh, describes the origins of banking and how it was related to money exchange and funding these international trips to bring things like wool from Italy or silk from from China and so forth. It's very, very interesting. And, and yes, the monetary system is like the foundation of this civilization that you bring, that you construct on top of. Because if the foundation is wrong, the construction is going to fall off. You know? So that is why a sound money system is so important. And it was so important for ages. And we have the golden period of liberalism you know, from the 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, it was based on sound money. And the huge wars were based on the fiat fraud. Yes. Right? And that, that foundation, it, it, accounting, everybody thinks of the accountant as the most boring person on earth, right? Yeah. 
the double entry book accounting method, and now we have Bitcoin, which is another advancement yeah. in accounting. But accounting is so important. There's a beautiful book called The Reckoning. It talks about uh, uh, the birth of accounting and how it went. And, and one of the things mentioned there is this, the king would say, nobody's going to tell me what I can spend or not spend. I will spend whatever it is because I own the kingdom. So reckoning and accounting enables the citizens to hold the king accountable and the power accountable. And, and to this date, it's, it's, a, it's a disgusting paradox. But the current day governments in Mexico, in the US, they don't use accounting. They have this in and out flow Value uh, at risk. No, no, no. Value at risk is very complicated. God forbid. No, no. They have the the accounting of a pupusa a saleswoman. This cash in and cash out. Mm -hmm. That's their accounting. This isn't from the government. Of and Mexico. the Fed's it's not balance even sheet. that because it's not cash in, cash out. It's just cash out. Just cash out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's deficit. It's it's disgusting. <laughs> and these people, you know, are the same ones that impose accounting uh, standards on companies, but they can't impose it on themselves. Eh? So accounting, what I'm saying, accounting is very important. It's honesty. To, it's To be able to keep you honest trust. and to get to the truth. Yes. yes. What's the truth here? Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> also, like you mentioned, that America used to be the home of the brave and the free, yeah. and that anywhere could have that. And Bitcoin is fuck you money. I mean, the president of El Salvador has said that just recently in a tweet. It's fuck you money. And that is the new modern way of freedom for everybody on I the individual so. level. I it's just the so. most important. Yes, yes. I, I it think does you feel have a, a little bit like Atlas Shrugged, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going yeah. to the camp where all the people disappear to. Is the Bitcoin world there? Every time you see, like, on Twitter, somebody is going to adopt Bitcoin. The jungle it feels paradise. feels like the... Yes. Yeah, like like the camp or what was it like this magical place where everybody uh, yeah. worked for in the magical you know. place so max always says you don't change bitcoin bitcoin changes you good point so how do you feel bitcoin has changed you and in what way no well it's given me a lot more confidence in my ability to survive and yeah. given adverse effects you know mm -hmm. how, about, how about you how about you? <laughs> you're young still, yeah. so I mean, your your path. You haven't well, been through what all we have been through. No, <laughs> I haven't. I haven't been through the crisis of the '80s, but um, I think um, I've always heard about the gold standard through my grandfather sure. and my father, and uh, so I've always been very aware of fiat money and. Uh, the nonsense of inflation, no? Sure. So, yeah, I think Bitcoin is like the greatest innovation that we've seen so far, and it fixes this this uh, corrupt system, no? Um, and in a way, like when you hear that, like the meek shall inherit the earth, in a way, you know, what happens is it is places like El Salvador or Nigeria where they don't have the benefit of the US dollar being able to be printed and sent to everybody at home, that they have to survive and they find things like Bitcoin first. So in a way, like they're the ones that inherit this new Bitcoin world, the hyper-Bitcoinization. I think that the economies were that, that, that have been uh, subject to bad uh, fiat uh, frauds, because sure. there's degrees of fraud, okay? Not all the fiat fraud is the same. Sure. Right. It's getting to where, for example, the U.S. It, they have like eight trillion of uh, of assets on the balance sheet, and four trillion. I mean, they doubled the balance sheet in two years. That is pretty wild yeah. on the wild, wild side. Yeah. yeah. But it didn't used to be like that. Now, before the financial crisis in the nineteen in, in, in two thousand and seven. The assets were 0.7 trillion. 0.7. Wow. 
this is 2007. This is like Hugo Chavez level printing. And then they went to 8 trillion. Yeah. And now they're talking, oh, we're going to taper and, and it's bullshit. They're never going to taper. Because how come they're going to get rid of all these bonds they bought? They can't. Who's going to buy no, them? There's no market. Who's going to buy those bonds? Nobody. Maybe if Elon Musk gets this tomorrow. Are we buying is bonds? I'm not buying bonds. We're, 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 we're not, not buying bonds. Not, not over my dead body. We're buying, buying bonds. bonds. Right? Never. <laughs> Never. Under no circumstance. Happens to be that in the 80s in Mexico, the, the long-term debt was totally wiped out. Right. But surprisingly, investing in short-term Mexican treasury bills was actually a very good investment comparable to investing in U.S. dollars. Why? Because interest went, rates went through the roof right. and the government needed money, so they were begging and, and, and asking for money. And they paid these huge rates and it was very short-term money, like 30 days. Right. So they had to pay more and more and more and more every, every month. And that way, the original peso investment became even more than the dollar investment. But you had to be uh, very smart and invest only in 30-day money yeah. and roll it into the next emission. Here's a question, uh, a banking question, um, that would I would ask you because you live in a rarefied world mm -hmm. of, of uh, people that are influential in markets. So let's go back to 1993 for a second. 93. With George Soros. He broke the Bank of England. Yeah. In what's called a speculative attack. <laughs> right? Isn't that amazing? He borrowed at cheap to break the Bank of England. Today, I've said that people like Michael Saylor at MicroStrategy is engaging in something similar. Mm -hmm. He's able to borrow at very cheap rates yeah. to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair comparison, sir? That's amazing, eh? You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've met Michael through Twitter. We, I had them, not met him in person. I put you guys in touch. And, and we're going to, yeah, we're going to have dinner actually at his place yeah. in April. Stacey knows oh, I'm the god, <laughs> you go. godmother. The godmother. <laughs> right. I'm like, you so too, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah. I mean, what he did was really uh, up the ante, huh? Right. It's, it's it's even more than all in. Well, what do you think about that? What do you? What do you want <laughs> but in? more Does than all in, because he owes money, right? <laughs> he borrowed money yeah. to buy Bitcoin. Mm. He borrowed fiat to buy Bitcoin. So he short fiat, a long term bonds. Right. Had a low rate. Right. Which, by the way, I think is a very good idea. Right. Anyway. That's right. If, I mean, if somebody loaned me money at 1% at 30 years, I'm signing up, you know? Right. Just give me, give, me, give me the money and I'll do the bond, right? Okay. So that part I understand. Now the other part is taking all that money and investing it in Bitcoins. Well, yeah, I'm a pretty aggressive investor. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm not scared of practically anything. But this concentration <laughs> of a bet in the single asset, yeah. that's too much for me. And for me, you know. Wow. So, you're, so this is like Milan but versus isn't, is Florence. But isn't there a little like... Now, if it pays off, and I think it will, he's going to blow it through the roof. Yes, yes. But it's a big risk. Yep. But, but are you immune from envy? Totally. You know, I have a very good friend, a Middle Eastern guy. And he has a fucking bigger plane than this. He's a 747, yeah. right? Now, he also has a bigger yacht than mine. It's like three times the size of the yacht. And he has a lot more homes than I do. Why would I be envy of him? My chick, I love him. And he invites me to his yacht and his plane and his home. Fine. And would I feel smaller than him? I don't think so. I, I think that I have a better life than he has in many ways. Right. You can only live your own best life. You do you, and that's it. But it's fine if he has something else. Yeah. So envy is a really bad sentiment. Yes. It leads to absolutely no good, and it yeah. affects you personally more than the other guy. Yes. Right. It's a poison. Right. Yes. It's a poison. Right. So, and unfortunately, this world is full of envy. And uh, 
a lot of those, uh, we call them gobiernicolas. You know, there's no, <laughs> oh, a new word. There's no word for that. Gobiernicolas. Similar to pendejo? No, well, it has that too, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's this breed a of... Uh, of pendejo. <laughs> it's this breed of uh, diminished humans that, that love and, and worship the big state. They like to be part of the big state. Right, right. This is a gobiernicola. Like, but, how do you say cavernicola in the uh, caveman? caveman. Well, we, the uh, caveman would be the government. Right. But, I, I mean, I called you a billionaire club, and that's the but, thing about Bitcoin is there is a notion, other than Michael Saylor, who everybody knows how many Bitcoin he owns, is nobody <laughs> knows how many Bitcoin you have, right? Yeah. This is a part of our identity as Bitcoiners. First of all, it's not a good policy to talk about how much you have in general. Second, it has security risk. Third, it, what's the point? It, uh, I, I always say, I have a portfolio of assets and I have a, an asset allocation. And that changes according to what I see, you know. Now, having said that, my main assets are my companies. Yes, you yes. Know? It's the stock in my companies. And people don't realize that this company is more valuable than that company because they're private. They know that this company is worth so much because it's listed, yeah. but it happens to be that that value as ascribed to it on the market might be off, might be on the low side, and it might be the real value is much higher than that, right? right. And this other company, which is private, nobody knows about, has a lot more value than this one. So anyway, my, my assets are the stocks in the companies that I have. They're doing great. I wouldn't sell them. I've never planned to sell them at all. I hope the kids can manage them as companies going forward. And that's, we should talk about that uh, later, about what to do with with your assets when you pass. But anyway, um, so that part of the asset allocation is not changing or it changes very slowly by, by selling one company. For example, we sold the cellular company and we turned it into the fiber optic company, which is doing much better than the cellular company. But then I have the liquid assets. Yeah. So liquid assets, yeah, people can but relate But I want to that. ask you about this. This drives me crazy. You're the third richest man in, in Mexico all the time. I want to, like, every time I see that go through on Bitcoin Twitter, I'm like, stop saying that. The but third. Is it the first time? Makes me time feel bad. Because of Bitcoin Twitter, I've seen people say to you, have fun staying poor. <laughs> <laughs> is that the first time that ever happened to you? Yeah. Because you, you, so there you go. <laughs> it's all this relative. I'm poor relative to that or that or the other one, right? Well, they, because you're not 100% in Bitcoin, because you have assets. Yeah. Like, why haven't you sold your companies and bought Bitcoin? I know a lot of my billionaire colleagues, a lot of them. And they might be uh, 20 times more net worth. Yes, yes. Than I do. Yeah. But I live a pretty good life. Yeah. How you choose to live and what you choose to do, mm -hmm. all right? And I'm not talking here about spending this yacht, the plane, the vacation, and the blue. what do you spend your time on, right? And I'm very happy with what we do. Well, yeah. getting back to, uh, if I may, to Michael Saylor for a second. So he has launched what I would describe as a speculative attack on the U.S. dollar. Uh, yeah. And at so the same how time- is it, How is it different from from what Soros did. It's not, in my view, it's the same. But here's the thing. He also says that, in his view, in the future, that Bitcoin will be the world reserve asset. Yeah. And that the US dollar will remain world reserve currency. Now, in the context of what we're talking about here in terms of fiat money and yeah. the dollar, etc., what do you respond to that? How do you respond? To that? I, I agree that, that, that it's that Bitcoin's on the way to being a world reserve asset. I 100% agree. I'm not sure that the dollar is going to make it, you know. Because, and now especially the U.S. has weaponized the dollar to further its imperial purposes. Why would, 
a self-respecting big country like Russia or China, why would they accept that as a reserve currency? Clearly it has a lot of downsides, you know? Right, so um, China's got to be questioning their multi-trillion dollar US dollar reserve position. Yeah. They're also saying that um, countries that store gold in America, that gold is now subject to seizure uh, in, in the New York Fed, where a lot of that gold is stored. So that's not even safe anymore. I mean, to me, it seems like Bitcoin isn't reacting to the chaos, but Bitcoin is causing the chaos because Bitcoin changes people. And it, it makes, it's a mirror where if you're a person with uh, decency in your heart, yeah. you, 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 it, you become more decent and you think about doing other benevolent things. Yes. If you're a person who's got a heart that's not well and you are envious, envious, yes, it, it makes you more envious, it makes you worse. <laughs> it's interesting. I, you know, it brings out uh, both sides. It's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, this is when I see you on Twitter and I've seen your Bitcoin journey. I say, and I, because I know your, your dad, and, and we know him to be a good-hearted man. And yeah. He's just been so generous and so giving, you know, and he's such a storyteller and a Rick on tour. And, and so, in, in with you on Twitter, it's like, it, it seems as though Ricardo is, is flourishing on this Bitcoin <laughs> standard in a Evangelizing. way. Evangelizing. It, yeah, it's very interesting. But then some people become like, um, more yeah, like yes, they want, they, they, like they countries are going flipping out. The IMF is flipping out. Christine Lagarde is flipping out. The fiat money world is flipping out because yeah. they're bad people to begin with. Absolutely. They're bad, dishonest people and they tell a lot of lies. And they're causing tremendous harm to millions of people. And this is not, I mean, we laugh at it because we now we recognize the reality, but what's happening to the fiat world is a disgrace. Now, people that are expecting a pension are going to be defrauded of their pension. People that have saved money for their retirement, they're not going to have the money because it's not going to be there. It's going to evaporate. This is a disgrace. And that's why I said living through this in the 80s in Mexico, it, it, it takes away any illusion that you might have that this is for, for good or there was it's, it's a, a robbery. Only so, is not highway robbery. I've, I noticed we're starting to descend soon. Um, what are you? I know you're meeting with the president of El Salvador. Like, what? What are your general impressions of what he's done for El Salvador? Mm -hmm. The response globally to what he's done, and what do you hope to see when you get there? He's obviously a very sharp guy. He's young, and he's done these extraordinary things. So I need to have a, a better sense of the person. Because, you know, whatever you say or do on, on media, it's not the same person. You know? Yes, you have yes. To, you have to, what's he talking about? I want to understand what he wants to do and, and, how, and how he plans to do it. I want to hear it from him. But obviously, he, his capacity to do things different is, is evident. So that's very interesting. And, you know, this thing of having Bitcoin being legal tender in El Salvador, that changes things completely because now it's not just an asset. Now it's real right. money. Right. Yeah, at least in that jurisdiction. That's right. So, I mean, it's it's a very interesting. I, mean, I, I see your eyes going back and forth like this, and you're thinking, <laughs> like, well, you're, you're 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 thinking what this is going to do. I mean, <laughs> can the regulators ultimately? You see, it seems to me that there's an epic battle between fiat money evil. And Bitcoin money, which is the best, soundest money ever, it's good. It's good versus evil. Yes. I mean, without being too dramatic about it, right. but it still does seem this way. No, so, is. in your concerns about the regulators, ultimately, at the end of the day, win because they've got the weapons, they've got the money printer. But are we at the precipice of a moment in history when they lose? I would love to say yes, but remember that these people are there because they are empowered by um, a democratic process. Yeah. So really <laughs> you should go back to question, you know, the, the, the foundation of this, uh, of this civilization. The other foundation is the, is the social contract, which is the democratic God. I just read this book, Democracy, the God that failed. And it's stunning, you know, because 
it, basically what it says is if uh, if three wolves and one lamb agree to vote what's for dinner, you know who's going to lose, right? Yes, yes. So that's a problem with democracy, right there. No. Majority rule is no fun. The well, other the, the other day we were playing a Monopoly game, <laughs> and inevitably someone ends up with all the money. Right. Yeah. So what happens if you take a vote and say, so what should we do? Expropriate him. Let's take a little money from him. <laughs> but if you do that enough times, then you can't play the game. You can't right. play the game. So yes, because democracy as currently being presented is majority vote is always right. And whatever the people say is going to be right. But that's not true with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a different consensus mechanism. Well, I agree. Right? Well, but that's why I'm saying this evil of fiat money fraud is being sustained by a democratic process. And it's being voted into power every day. But El Salvador making Bitcoin legal tender, it filters into their governance of the country as well, and that can spread, and democracy as yeah. a failed institution gets eradicated. Well, that's why it's so strange, and that's why I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting now, this according, person. According to uh, sources, you have a library of approximately 40,000 books. Oh, more than that, but yes. Huge. I haven't read all of them. Right, I've yeah. read about 10,000. You, you are a bibliophile. <laughs> yeah. I would not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a book. You tell me, what, how, how does this book rank, uh -huh. this book? Ah, fantastic. I've been pushing it all around, and I'm very much looking to meeting uh, Safe Dinamuz. He's coming to our Festival of Ideas next week. Uh, this is on uh, next Thursday. He'll be here in Mexico. And this is an amazing uh, uh, testimony of how uh, money has evolved it's really, really a, a very interesting and simple, enlightening. It, it makes you think about money. You know, why is this round thing here? It's a round rock that these islanders used to use as a representation of value. So the guy who had the most rocks won, right? And why are these bars here? Same reason, the guy who had the most bars won. And now why is this Bitcoin coin there? Because now that's the new standard. It's, it's, a, it's a very good book. So in the, the historical background he gives in terms of uh, Keynesian economics and the history yes. of money, you, and you feel that it's on spot on? It's on, totally you, spot on. And, and I think the historical perspective yeah. is especially valuable. Talked about the Florence. Right. Right. And uh, was your confidence in Bitcoin accelerated absolutely. after reading this book? Absolutely. This is a must read, not only to understand Bitcoin, but to understand the fiat fraud. Right. Because you understand, have to understand both. Right. See, if you, if you just understand the fiat fraud, you're a good ways ahead. But then you have to understand Bitcoin. That's where my dad and Schiff stayed here. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is... Hugo and Schiff are here at Gold. Yes, yes, yes. They never made the leap. No, here. they didn't. That's that's this is, unfortunately. Un Uncle Ricky is here, <laughs> right? And yeah. uh, here we, everyone left here. That's all gone. Yeah, we're not there anymore. But a lot of people aren't there. So now we've 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 covered the history of money very well, I think. And and, no, and, and with Peter Schiff, you think he's just stubborn, essentially. He's intellectually, he's not without an intellect, but he's stubborn what 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 makes him so stubborn to this is it because he has such a vested interest in in this now he can't change his his opinion because it would he would seem like he's easily to change his opinion fickle or something i mean i don't know i don't know him i just seen a few of the things that he posts eventually have you read I, this book by the way the book of max this i is, have not this is a spiritual guy i have he, not this is but you're i guy. hope you're going to uh we're going to uh <laughs> That this is, uh, you know, Michael Saylor calls me the high priest of Bitcoin. Good. <laughs> Let me see it. I have not seen it. It has. It's a very many uh, things in there, sayings from the years of being in this industry. When, so, when so did it come out? Just three months ago. 
Oh, not even, I'm not sorry, even, I like, missed this one. And there's a Spanish ago. version as well. You know. Well, you have to give me one autograph. I'll yeah. buy it if necessary there's with some, some coins. There's some <laughs> language in there on par with Pendejo. <laughs> I'll, 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 I will uh, I'll give you this copy. You give yeah. me that? Good. Sponsored but we, by Swan. You have Swan to dedicate. Swan Bitcoin is the sponsor. Okay. That's who's sponsoring this lovely production. What's that? What's that? It's an on-ramp. An easy way to buy Bitcoin. Oh, so I didn't Swan know. So Swan Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin only you can buy, you can't sell. That you buy it and you transfer it directly to your hard, you know, your cold storage. And they have a small commission, I assume. Yeah. It's Great. a fantastic. I'll send you some information. It's the most competitive. It's Based dependent. where? America, but yeah, they exactly. offer all over the world. They sell in Mexico, uh, El Salvador, all over the world. They can sell. Good. Thank yeah, you very it's, much. It's, a, very it's, it's all Bitcoin. You should check it out because yeah, they're absolutely. like, uh, we we try to focus only on Bitcoiners, 100%. Good. No, no shit coining. So no selling, huh? No selling. Only they buy. don't want to encourage you to sell. Oh, wow. Thank, Thank you, man. Uncle Ricky. <laughs> Uncle Ricky. <laughs> a ver, mira. <laughs> <laughs> but you know coming back to the, the the book yeah i mean he did a really good job of hand holding you all the way to bitcoin because he's a professor yeah and he's an excellent professor very very interesting now about Schiff, it's he's like my dad you know i think my dad is totally uh, invested in gold and emotionally He's, he's done that for all his life, and he just can't bear to part with that idea. Which, by the way, is not such a bad idea. Having gold is not a bad idea. Not bad. Having everything in gold is a bad asset allocation. Speaking trash about Bitcoin is a bad idea. <laughs> Do you see this different thing? Huh? Sure. Like Schiff, for example, trashing Bitcoin all the time. Yeah. Well, he's totally wrong. Yes. Right. Totally, absolutely wrong. Like my dad, he's wrong. Yeah. Now, talking good about gold, it's okay. Right. Yeah. Well, we were at his house in Connecticut, uh, uh, Peter Schiff. Oh, really? And Bitcoin was 20 bucks. 20? Yeah, 20 bucks. And I talked to him about it for an hour. He's like, well, no, I don't get it. And I've been and so for the last ten years, I yeah, always the, the funny remind thing, him of this. <laughs> he was he was on CNBC, and they they were like, "Well, Max Kaiser told you about Bitcoin at ten dollars, and you refused to buy it then." He says, "No, it was twenty. Nah. Was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's crazy. <laughs> By the way, you know the current price, you know, is not cross forty three today. It's interesting because everybody in the technical moon analysis is. Well, it's going to go back to 35 or 36, and then we'll buy it. It doesn't look like it's going down to 36 anymore. Huh? No. <laughs> I think technical analysis is a lot of value to offer in terms of timing. Because there's definitely bad time to buy, and there's bad time to sell. I think timing is important in the markets. And I've been around markets for a long time. But isn't I'm a pretty the good best trader time to too. buy when it's a bad time to buy? I mean, isn't that Warren Buffett's whole mantra that he buys Well, you know what Buffett says about Bitcoin. Yeah. He uh, totally don't get it. And he's part of the mafia. Totally. Against totally. Bitcoin. And, just and we so have you know, to call it out. He's a fiat money fraudster. Yes. Is that, is that a fair statement? He is, absolutely. Can we say this? On yeah, tape I think so. He <laughs> Warren Buffett is a fiat money fraudster. <laughs> I think so. My nickname is Her Royal Fucking New All Time Highness. So I make a, a, a point of buying all time new highs. All time new highs. Yeah, like, <laughs> I like to buy it up top. <laughs> top tick Stacy. I, that included a dollar. It was a dollar you know, that went down from well, there. It, again, it depends on, on what you're doing. That's why yeah. it's so difficult to give financial advice. He's, everybody has a different situation personally, yes, yes. financially. Right. It's, it's, it, there's no, what should we do? I don't know. What, 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 what have to understand your situation. Yeah. And that's why giving financial advice is so delicate. Now, having said that, I can speak for myself, right? What is my asset allocation? Other than my stocks, I have a liquid portfolio and I have about half of it in oil stocks. Right. Which wow. I traded out of gold mining stocks because they didn't yeah. go anywhere yeah. for ages. Yeah. So I lost a lot of time and money 
didn't lost money, but I didn't make money because these goddamn oil and, the, and the gold oh. and silver didn't move. So I oil. traded out of gold mining stocks. I traded into oil stock, which was beautiful. Yeah. It went through the roof. Yeah. That's an inflation hedge, I suppose. More, Not only that, more because hedge. more, more, more. It wasn't that was not the reason. The reason was oil stocks were totally depressed because of the yeah, airy green. fairy green yeah. lobby. Right. But you bought them because they were a terrible idea. Exactly. The timing was terrible exactly. for oil stocks. That's why you bought exactly. it. So it goes against what you just said. No, the timing was terrible <laughs> to sell them. It was timing was terrible. It was good for buying them. It, they were worth nothing. Right. So I agree with buying cheap, and then I've seen them go up, and now it's the most difficult part is when do you trade out? Right, right. there's always two decisions you have to get right. Yeah. Because one to buy, one to sell. Exactly, go. right? So, right, so with the oil... No, but that, but... With, so, the, with, with the COVID pandemic, oil stocks crashed because we were going into a deflationary that's spiral. That's when I bought it. That's, that's why it became a contrarian play mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. time. And the, and there was, the exactly. yields were juicy, like 5 or 6%. So I used to have all gold and mining stocks right and bitcoins and now i have more bitcoins and then i bought a bunch of uh, bitcoin mining stocks which i have not done well but very volatile so but what, how are the margins on those like uh like a riot blockchain for example is, is a pretty big name i have mara mara marathon bit farms so the mark, how do you compare it to, let's say, gold or silver mining? And I also have MicroStrategy as that part of that. We do too. As yeah. part of the mining strategy. Yes, we yeah. have that as well. So, so how do you compare those to traditional gold and silver miners? Do you, is there a comparative analysis or no? Yeah, you know, I've been cracking my mind around Bitcoin mining for a long time. And I think the best way to uh, approach it is by saying, okay, I have this much fiat capital today. What can I do with this fiat capital. I can put it in uh, fiat stocks. I can put it in fiat Bitcoin mining stocks. Still fiat. I can put it in fiat stock stocks like uh, MicroStrategy related to Bitcoin. Yeah. Or I can put it into Bitcoin. Or I can buy a Bitcoin mining operation that produces Bitcoin. That's the options, right? Right. Okay. So now, for mining, you really have to think of turning your fiat into Bitcoin and then investing that Bitcoin into machines. And will that Bitcoin produce more Bitcoin down the road? It seems like it does, but it's not certain because this halving and hash power might cut down the benefits in the future. Yeah. So my closest calculation today is if I buy a hundred bitcoins worth of mining gear and, and all the paraphernalia, not just the machines, but the setting up. And if I pay for the energy at four cents a kilowatt, right. I'm going to make about 50 bitcoins in the next 12 months out of a hundred investment. So it's not a bad investment, but the problem is what happens in the next 12 months. Will there be another 50 bitcoins or will there be 20? Yeah. And maybe you didn't end up with the same bitcoins. So when you approach mining investment, you have to figure out over the period how much more Bitcoin you're going to get than just keeping the 100 Bitcoin, you know what I'm saying? Well, it seems like the vulnerability for those companies would be price of energy. Well, yes, if you, can, if, you, if you can get energy at a low price. And, but it's going up. And it's going to have to go up. Right. With MicroStrategy, my feeling is like we're playing the player. Like, I, I'm assuming Michael's going to do something with that massive pile. I mean, what he's done is, is is a double play. He's short fiat. Right. Yeah. So if if that goes right, it'll be much better investment. Right. Than the mining stocks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because it's a speculative attack on the U.S. dollar. Yes. Okay. See. But I don't see how. He However, can say the, he's the size of the attack is not the same size as the Soros attack on the no, British it's pound. Not. It's not. But if uh, why don't other companies? It's like in the Weimar Germany. Yeah. There was a couple of industrialists. Yes. Who borrowed cheaply from. The bank, and they made they became the richest man in Germany. I agree. Isn't this similar? When it, money didn't, dies. it didn't serve them a lot because look what happened later. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, Fair they enough. were bombed too. Yeah. Fair enough.
tardes, gracias a los amigos de la prensa por acompañarnos. Es para mí un privilegio recibir al empresario de origen mexicano, el señor Ricardo Salinas, en nuestra tierra, gracias, la tierra de la libertad económica. Nosotros estamos trazando una nueva ruta y sin duda necesitamos alianzas, socios estratégicos y como dice el presidente, traer a las mentes más brillantes. Bienvenido a El Salvador. Embajadora, muchísimas gracias. Siempre es un placer volver a El Salvador. Tenemos una larga historia en el Grupo Salinas de estar aquí en El Salvador. Tuvimos eh, la televisora, el Canal 12, los gratos recuerdos de Mauricio Funes, que era nuestro presentador ahí. Y luego tuvimos el Banco Azteca, pero bueno, todo eso quedó en el pasado. Y me llama mucho la atención que ahora hay una nueva administración, unas nuevas ideas, y creo que... Este tema que mencionó la embajadora de la libertad económica es importantísimo. Yo soy siempre apoyador de la libertad y por eso me interesa mucho ver qué hay de nuevo en El Salvador. Gracias. Bond, the financial instrument that's going to transform this country from a relatively small Central American metropolis into a behemoth of global Bitcoin significance and this whole region's about to explode and all those fiat money cucks like the United States and Great Britain are going down the shitter and this is what's all happening right here. Great to meet you. We'll huh? see you in Miami. I'll see you in Miami. Bye, Have guys. a good time. Bye, bye, see, you. see you. See you. Enjoy the pupusas. Looking forward to my yellow shoes. <laughs> They're shoes. coming. They're coming. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Woo.